القدس تنادينا قدس تنادي قدس تنادي قدس تنادينا الحمد لله وكفى والصلاة والسلام على عباده الذين استفى خصوصا على أفضلهم وخاتم النبيين محمد الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وبع فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ونزلنا عليك الكتاب تبيانا لكل شيء وهدى ورحمه وبشرى للمسلمين صدق الله العظيم سوره النحل في القران سوره نمبر 16 انتايتلد ذا بي النحل ذا بي ان الله سبحانه وتعالى ديكليز ان وي سنت داون ذا بوك the quran sent it down on the o muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wasallam that this quran might explain all things and therefore that this quran might explain the strange world in which we live today the sun has never risen on a stranger world than this for those who see with one eye the other one is blind like the jal for those who see with one eye lots of people like that in the world today they say this is the best world that there's ever been and every day it grows better and better this is an age of progress unprecedented in history this is the age of cell phones this is the age of the aeroplane this is the age of the motor car this is the age of the internet this is the best age that there's ever been and every day it grows better and yet better and so the past represents that which has now been superseded by the present the civilizations of the past now belong to history they are moribund they have no role to play in the future of mankind because this is the best but there are those who see with two eyes not with one they see with the external eye and they also see with the with the internal eye cos university of new south wales doesn't talk about this for in her لا تعمل ابصار ولكن تعمل قلوب التي في الصدور so the heart sees and the heart can hear for those who see with two eyes they see something else about the world today when they see with the word of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala they say this is the worst world there's ever been this is the worst there's never been more godlessness in the world than today there's never been more corruption in the world than today there's never been such a collapse of morals around the world as there is today there has never been such a destruction of character and integrity around the world as there is today 
and there has never been more relentless biting oppression ever in history as there is around the world today but particularly the oppression which comes from that beast which has come out of the land which land al ardul muqaddasa da batul ard the state of israel there has never been more oppression than there is today they say this is not only the worst of all worlds but every day it grows worse and worse and so what a world of a difference there is from the one who sees with one eye and the one who sees with the light of the quran with two eyes and in this book there is guidance huda that explanation and that guidance have come from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as rahma as rain drops from allah for hearts which are thirsty and parched and for those who have the good sense and the wisdom and the time most people very busy for those who have the good sense and the wisdom to go to the book of allah and search search for that which explains all things and search for that guidance with which to respond appropriately to the awesome challenges of the age in which we live today and who when they are blessed with that explanation and that guidance they accept it and they embrace it and they apply it regardless of the price they have to pay bushra lahum good news and glad tidings for such people they will understand what others cannot not even the government of australia and they will succeed when others will not brothers and sisters in islam assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah it's been about 9 to 10 months since uh, we were last here at lakemba after i left you i went to pakistan briefly they allowed me into the country even though i said it's no longer the islamic republic of pakistan it's now the american republic of pakistan <laughs> and then i went back to my homeland the caribbean the island of trinidad in the caribbean and then i went to south africa and i was there for the last 3 months in south africa and i went to hong kong and i went to singapore i've been going to singapore for the last 14 years and the ulama in singapore of course they are they are restricted so the ulama in singapore they say to me you speak because we cannot <laughs> so i speak and the people flock in huge numbers particularly the young ones and so for 14 years now i've been speaking to mammoth gatherings in singapore but now the word of truth is too powerful for the model state so this time they denied me the freedom to speak publicly <laughs> for the first time in 14 years and i lectured in malaysia and now we thank allah that by his leave we are once again with you here in lakemba we praise him and we glorify him and we beseech him this night most humbly for his guidance and for his blessings and most of all for his protection because not all around us are friends and we pray for peace and for blessings on all his noble messengers and in particular on the last of them all the blessed prophet muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wasallam our subject is morals and character of the muslim youth and we'll attempt 
to explain the attack which has been launched, the devastating attack which has been launched on the morals and character of the Muslim youth. It is not happening by accident. We want to know why has it been launched. We want to know what is the objective of those who have launched the attack on the morals and character of the Muslim youth. And we want to know who has launched the attack. This is our topic tonight. We want to begin the subject in a very unconventional way. Yes, to identify the enemy. When we spoke here 10 months ago about Al-Masih, the Messiah, a prophet who was promised to Banu Israel and who when he comes would be their prophet, would be known as Al-Masih, the Messiah, and who would rule the world from the throne of Dawood alayhi salam. That's his mission. And his rule will be eternal. It's there in the words of the prophet Isaiah. But when the Messiah came, they rejected him. They said, وَنَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنْ هَذَا They say, he's a bastard. And a bastard cannot be the Messiah. And then when they saw him die on the cross before their very eyes, they saw him die, he couldn't be the Messiah. Why? He's dead. But he didn't rule the world from Jerusalem. So he couldn't be the Messiah. And so, they're waiting for the Messiah to come. You couldn't live in New York and not know that. <laughs> what they didn't know, and what no one knew, no one knew, until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down the Quran was, وَمَا قَتَلُوهُ No, they did not kill him. وَمَا صَلَبُوهُ No, they did not crucify him. وَلَكِنْ شُبِّهَ لَهُمْ Allah made it appear to them like that. But Rafa'ahu Allah Allah raised him unto himself. One day, he's coming back. And when he comes back, that is precisely what he's going to do. When the messenger of Allah returns, he's going to rule the world from Jerusalem. And what he brings with him is Islam, and so Islam will rule the world from Jerusalem. No one can stop that, not even governments of the world. No one can stop that. They can take it and chew over it and do what they want with it. <laughs> but they can't stop it. The Prophet ﷺ, however, informed us, and when I speak to you, inshallah, we're going to have a repeat lecture on Jerusalem in the Quran sometime about a week and a half from now and then we'll give the details <coughs> the prophet alayhi was to release into the world a person not a system a person created by Allah and endowed with awesome power and awesome versatility and a PhD in deception <laughs> and he would be known as Al Masih al Dajjal. When he's released into the world, his mission would be to impersonate the Messiah. If he is to impersonate the Messiah, then he must also rule the world from Jerusalem with what would appear to be eternal rule and therefore the end of history. How is Dajjal going to accomplish this mission? If he is to rule the world, it means that the state of Israel must rule the world. Because this is the throne of Dawood al-Islam. So number one, Dajjal will have to liberate the Holy Land, which is under the rule of the Ottoman Islamic Empire. You're going to have to defeat the whole Ottoman Islamic Empire. 
to take the Holy Land from them. And the Ottoman Islamic Empire has the Khilafah. And if the Khalifa declares Jihad, then to liberate the Holy Land, you're going to have to fight a gigantic war against the entire world of Islam. That's a big job for Dajjal. Not only does he have to do that, he's going to bring the Jews back to the Holy Land, not as tourists. No. Back to the Holy Land to reclaim the Holy Land as theirs. How is Dajjal going to do that? Because that is going to spark a war in which every single Muslim on the face of the earth will be fighting. So Dajjal is going to have a very, very, very big war on his hands. More than that, Dajjal will have to restore a state of Israel in the Holy Land. And convince the Jews that this is the Israel of Nabi Da'ud Islam and Nabi Suleiman Islam. When he does that, the world of Islam will be after him. War, jihad. How is Dajjal going to accomplish this? And finally, and the biggest one of all, Dajjal has to take that state of Israel and make of it the ruling state in the world. How can he accomplish this? If there is a world of Islam there who is prepared to fight and to die in the way of Allah. The answer is Dajjal has a big job, a job on his hands. What he has to do is to destroy the very foundations of power in the Muslim community around the world. If you can destroy our power, then we cannot fight. If he can also deceive us, then we would not be able to understand what is happening. If he can imprison us in a political slavery and imprison us in an economic slavery, we lose our freedom, we cannot fight. Well, I have news for you, Lakemba. Dajjal has already accomplished nearly all that he has to accomplish. All that now remains, and as soon as Mr. Bush attacks Iraq, then you will see the events unfolding. But more of this, when we speak on the subject of Jerusalem in the Quran, then you'll see the events unfolding which will re realize for Israel, the state of Israel, the status of being the ruling state in the world. And if you defer with me, just sit there and wait. Just sit there and wait. The Jal has already accomplished nearly everything he set out to accomplish. The question we ask tonight is, how did he do it? What is that strategy? with which he has attacked the character and morals of Muslim youth around the world. And so we have lost power. What can we do tonight in Lakemba? What can we do to build power once again? That kind of power which cannot be destroyed, not even with a nuclear weapon, they cannot destroy that power. What are the foundations of power? Well, you have external foundations. That is your numerical strength. But that is not essential to power. وَكَمْ مِنْ فِئَةٍ قَلِيلَةٍ غَلَبَتْ فِئَةً so numerical strength is not that essential. Then there is the strong, the strength of the economy, but at Badr, they were the rich people's army, and we were the army of the refugees. <laughs> and then there is your weapons, but at Badr they had state-of-the-art weapons. 
They had, uh, was it 700 camels and 100 horses and state-of-the-art armor? And we had, we hardly had, we had no armor. We hardly had any camels and probably two horses. But we defeated them. And so the external foundations of power, yes, they are important, but they're not absolutely essential. Well then, what are the other foundations of power? The answer is internal power. What are the foundations of internal power? Which if that is destroyed, then all fall down. The answer is that in internal power you have faith. Those who have faith in Allah can never be defeated. You can kill them. But after you cut down the tree, the thing is still growing. What kind of a tree is this? No matter how many times we cut down the tree, it is still growing. Wala takulu yuktalu fi sabilillahi amwat. walakin la tashurun. And so you cannot defeat a people who live for Allah and therefore who will die for Allah. And this is what we've been asked to proclaim in the Quran. But only men can proclaim it. Rats can't do it. What's the difference between a man and a rat? We're going to give that definition just now. What does Allah ask of us to say in the Quran? And when we say it, I tell you that is power. Of course, they're going to say it's fundamentalism. They're going to say these are terrorists. <laughs> yes. These words are poison for the godless world. Poison. What are the words? Kul. Inna salati. Wa nusuki, wa mahiyaya, wa mamati, lillahi rabbil alameen, la sharika lahu, ila akhir al ayah. Say it, proclaim it, regardless of the price you have to pay. Verily, my prayer and my service of sacrifice and my very living and my very dying are all for Allah. And I will not become a part of your godless melting pot. La sharika la. I will not become a part of your godless melting pot. I tell you, they'll hit you. When you speak like that, they can't even digest their food now. <laughs> what can we do with these Muslims? We've tried everything, but Islam keeps coming back. I delivered a lecture in Singapore. And then the next day I got an email, the most beautiful email I've ever got in my life. I tell you, the government of Singapore must have hated that. <laughs> it came from an 18-year-old Muslim girl. And she wrote to me. She said, hi. She didn't know how to say, dear Maulana or dear Sheikh. She said, hi. I attended your lecture last night. Can I be your student? She was born in Singapore. She spent all her life living in Singapore. She studied in their schools. And at 18 years of age, she should have been a part of the godless melting pot. Or what I call the blue jeans jamat. <laughs> I hope you don't mind. But rather than that, when the truth was presented, not Imran. Now, the truth of Islam, we are only vehicles. 
When the truth was presented, that truth penetrated and pierced her heart. And so she said, can I be your student? When faith enters into the heart, now you live for Allah. And only those who live for Allah, only they will die for Allah. That's power. Use any yardstick with which to measure. That is power. Anyone who lives for Allah would be prepared to die for Allah. You cannot defeat such a man. You can put him in prison. But you cannot destroy him. You can kill him, but you cannot destroy him. And the truth for which he lived and died, that truth, as certain as the sun rises from the east, that truth will eventually triumph. That's power. They want to destroy that from the heart. How to destroy it? Now this part of the lecture is going to be a little difficult. So bear with me. Bear with me. If you don't understand it this time, get the tape. And listen to the tape recording again and again. So that you'll eventually understand it. The question is, how to destroy power? We say power rests on the foundations of faith. And in another moment, we're going to go to power resting on the foundations of Akhlaq, morality and ethics. The question is how to destroy power, and therefore how to destroy faith. Listen to the attack. The Prophet said, Sallallahu Ta'ala Alaihi Wasallam, every Prophet of Allah has warned his people about Dajjal, but I'm going to tell you something that no one said before me. Dajjal sees with one eye, his left eye, his right eye is blind, it looks like a bulging grip, but your Lord is not one eye. Between his eyes on his forehead is written the word kafir, kafara. And every mu'min will be able to read it, so Abu Lahab can't read it. Oh, but Abu, ha Abu Lahab has eyes. How come Abu Lahab can't read? But Ali radiallahu ta'ala who can read? They both have a pair of eyes. How come he can read, but he can't read? Good question, eh? Every mu'min will be able to read it, kafir. Whether that mu'min is katib or ghayru katib. Whether he's literate or illiterate, he can still read it. Now it's clear. That the mu'min is not reading with these eyes. Do we have any other eyes besides these eyes? Do we have any other heirs beside these heirs? Do we have any other means of acquiring knowledge other than external observation and rational inquiry? Dajjal says no. And modern Western civilization created by Dajjal says no. This is a branch of knowledge, I'm going to use a big word now, but you could try to hold on to it and understand it. This is a branch of knowledge which is called epistemology. Epistemology. Don't forget it. It is that branch of knowledge which studies knowledge. al ilm al-ilm. What is knowledge? How is knowledge acquired? What are the sources of knowledge? Hmm? This is epistemology. So Dajjal's epistemology is one eye. Knowledge comes only from external observation and rational inquiry. That of course is your university today. Hmm? But the Qur'an declares something else. The Qur'an declares that in addition to our external eyes, we also have 
internal capacity to see. And if you do not see with the internal eye, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala delivers a very, very powerful warning. What does he say about such people who are internally blind, like the government of the United States of America? What does he say about such people who are internally blind? Listen to what he says. Lahum kulubun la yafqahuna biha walahum a'ayunun la yubsiruna biha walahum adhanun la yasma'una biha they have eyes but they can't see they have ears but they can't hear they have hearts but they cannot understand ulaika kal an'am such people are just like cattle even though he's a sheikh and he has the hat and the beard and he has a PhD from Al-Azhar eh? and he quotes the Quran and the Hadith and he has a mountain of knowledge yes just like cattle even though he has a PhD from MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, yes, still like cattle. Just like cattle. <laughs> Such people are just like cattle. But Allah goes on to say more than that. He says, <laughs> No, they're worse than cattle. <laughs> they're more misguided than cattle. Hmm? <laughs> the attack that was launched by modern Western civilization is an epistemological attack to get mankind to accept this lie that knowledge comes only from external observation and rational inquiry. If knowledge comes from any other source, it is not knowledge. It belongs to a place in Orlando called Disneyland. <laughs> what happens of course today is called the scientific method what happens when a people accept that knowledge comes only from external observation and rational inquiry the answer is listen carefully the only world that we can know would be the world which we can observe. Hmm? Since this material world is the only world we can observe, it follows that this material world is the only world which we can know. And then they throw dust in our eyes to come to the next conclusion. Since this is the only world which we can know, this is the only world which exists. Welcome to materialism. Since this is the only world we can know, this is the only world which exists. There is no world beyond this world. There is no reality beyond material reality. Everything which belongs to the unseen world now belongs to Disneyland. <laughs> this is the attack on religion, on faith. The modern the modern world now becomes known as, you've heard the word before, the secular world. I've heard people saying to me, well, you know, we did a little bit of religious education, a little bit of secular education. And by secular education, they mean, well, we went to study some physics, 
and some chemistry and so on. That's secular education. And tafsir and hadith, that's religious education. No, brother, you don't understand the meaning of the word secular. What is secular? The opposite of secular is sacred. In order for something to become secular, you've got to take the sacred out of it. So in order for physics to become secular, you've got to take Allah out of it. Take the sacred out of it. That is secular. So once, once something becomes secular, it is now godless. The secular society is now the godless society. The secular world is now the godless world. This is materialism. This is the death of religion. Religion is now attacked. And the only part of religion which is now acceptable to the secular world is that part of religion which is observable. So the sacred heart of the deen, which is taqwa, the fear of Allah, that must now go. al ghaib now disappears from religion. When Christianity was attacked, what emerged? The Protestant movement. The Protestant movement is Christianity with the sacred heart of the religion removed from it. And then Judaism was attacked. And what emerged? Reform Judaism. Uh, actually a secular version of Judaism. The sacred heart of the religion is destroyed. And then Hinduism was also attacked. And Islam was attacked. As we adopt and we accept materialism, religion begins to lose its authenticity because we lose our faith in an unseen God. This is the only world. When we come to you to speak on Imam al-Mahdi and the return of the Khilafah, then we we'll see how Europe or Western civilization applied this philosophy to political thought and the modern secular state emerged and then there was the attack on the Khilafah the Khilafah was destroyed and it was replaced by the modern secular state that is a lecture on Imam al-Mahdi and the return of the Khilafah now we come to the heart of today's talk What are values? What is al-akhlaq? At the very heart of power is al-akhlaq. Anyone who is internally corrupt can never build power, internal power. All values come from Allah and we're going to take tonight two values in some detail and show you what happens when the value no longer comes from Allah but it comes from the secular society Lahul Asma'ul Husna 99 beautiful names and in each of these beautiful names is the foundation of Al Akhlaq he Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, is Al-Wadud, the God of love. He is Ar-Rahman, the compassionate God. He is Ar-Razaq, the one who provides. He is Al-Ghaffar, the one who forgives. When values come from Allah, then they are truly values. And al-akhlaq is actually the process through which we 
imbue ourselves with divine attributes. Tahallaku bi akhlaqillah, said the Prophet. The enemy wants to infiltrate our ranks. One of the ways in which the enemy infiltrates the ranks is to try to get spies. Huh? Pay him some money and he'll go into the masjid and he'll sit and he will listen and he'll tape record and he'll go back and report the spy. There was a young man in Miami and then the FBI approached him and asked him to become one of their informers and of course we'll pay you. All that we want you to do is to go into the masjid and listen and observe and take notes and tape record and come back and give it to us. If we send our people, it's going to be more dangerous for us. But if we choose a Muslim, we can do it. The young man said, no, I cannot betray my brothers. So the government of the United States of America threw him out of the country, took away his green card and threw him out of the United States. And his uncle told me this story. Now here is a young man who could not be bought. That's character. That's values. No, Uncle Sam, not for five dollars, and not for five hundred dollars, and not for five million dollars. I am not up for sale. That's character. You can't buy me, not even with a mountain of gold. That's character. That's morals. That's integrity. So they try. To attack you but if the heart is turned to Allah and you have in that heart honesty and truth and the fear of Allah then they can't buy you not even with a mountain of gold I want to show you what happens when the heart is not turned to Allah and we do not imbue ourselves with those divine attributes. I want to now turn to a subject that every young man is going to be mighty interested in. A subject called love. Falling in love. We have some young people here tonight, do we? You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I hope I don't take too much time on this subject, but it's very important. Because it deals with the heart of morality and character, the attack. If you want to understand how they destroy the power of a people, they know that it's the young men who wage war. So what they do in Karachi in Pakistan, they flood the market with what they call blue movies, pornography. Hmm? Every single street corner now has a video shop. And the video shop are peddling these blue movies. Do you think the blue movies reached to Pakistan by accident? You must be dreaming. It is the enemy who is attacking. And as the young men look at the blue movies, the pornography, in the videos and on the internet, what happens inside? قَدْ أَفْلَحَ مَنْ زَكَّاهَا 
وقد خاب من دساها Successful will be those who purify themselves and those who corrupt themselves will end up in the garbage bin وقد خاب من دساها They understand it better than we do and so they attack you internally and as you watch these blue movies and this pornography and the internet you are internally corrupted and the internal foundations of power are now destroyed so let's come to love you know surah al-layl and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with such economy of language he teaches us about the male female relationship he says بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم. he says والليل إذا يغشى. he takes an oath by the night and that by by that which it shrouds so mysteriously, so splendidly it shrouds it covers. and then he goes on to say والنهار إذا تجلى and he takes an oath by the day and by its bright light nothing covered here and then he comes on to say وَمَا خَلَقَ الذَّكَرَ وَالْأُنْثَى وَمَا خَلَقَ الذَّكَرَ وَالْأُنْثَى that in the same way that Allah created the night and the day so too did Allah create the male and the female hmm? and then comes the last verse in the passage inna sa'ayyakum lashatta that you are functionally different the, the day has the job of the day and the night has the job of the night now this passage of the Quran actually belongs to the subject of Islam and the modern feminist revolution hmm? but we're not going to be doing this lecture in Sydney Islam or an Islamic response to the modern feminist revolution and its struggle for women's liberation but there's a part of that subject which is relevant tonight when the day is day and the night is night look what happens when a man is a man not a rat look what happens when the day is approaching the night do you notice what happens there is tremendous excitement there is the excitement of two powerful forces attracted to each other and as the day approaches the night the day expresses its excitement and its joy by painting the sky in a riot of colors it's called a sunset you got sunset in Sydney <laughs> that's the excitement of the day approaching the night and then when the day meets the night the day plunges into the arms of the night intense attraction and then after the day has disappeared into the arms of the night then all through the night there's a time for rest and there's a time for sleep and there's a time for love and there's a time for worship and then there is the time to say goodbye and now the day must leave but the night is holding on to the day and so no longer plunging now the day has to struggle to get out of the arms of the night and so only one ray of light at a time until eventually the day can extricate itself from the arms of the night 
That is the intense attraction of the male for the female. Of course, when, as in Singapore, and in France, and the United States, and in Australia, the feminist revolution takes over, and now the night wants to become day. You understand that? <laughs> then the night will no longer be truly night. No. Now she dresses like a man. Have you seen her? With a jacket and the trousers? I've seen her with a tie as well. <laughs> now she has to talk like a man. The voice is masculine. I'm not going to mention the name of anybody in Mr. Clinton's cabinet. <laughs> now the face also becomes masculine. Sometimes you can't tell the difference. Now she has to behave like a man. No more of the shyness and the bashfulness of a woman. As she comes to approach Musa, Nabi Musa alayhi salam by the well. And she's so shy and she's so bashful. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes her. No, 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 no. Uncle Sam's daughters ain't like that. She's got to behave like a man. And now there's rivalry between the two. And in consequence of the night trying to become day, she loses her femininity. And when she loses her femininity, then the attraction begins to wane. Wane means? To decrease. What happens when the day is no longer attracted to the night? Answer? The day will now mate with the day. The day will now mate with the day. Who prophesied that? Muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam. And so homosexuality and lesbianism is a necessary consequence of the adoption of the modern feminist revolution. We quoted from the Quran to point out to you the intensity of the attraction of the male for the female. Particularly when you are young and the fires burn very bright. They say, you got to fall in love first. And only after you've fallen in love, then you get married. Of course, marriage is very expensive. Because you not only have to pay for the wedding dress and the wedding clothing, and you have to pay for the banquet hall and all of these things, but you also have to pay your lawyer and she has to pay her lawyer to have the prenuptial agreement. <laughs> and then you get married. And you pledge eternal love for each other. You've heard it before. Eternal love for each other. And eternity lasts for six months. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Eternity lasts for six months. We had so much love for each other. If you're a teenager tonight, listen to me. We had so much love for each other. Where did it go? After they got married, love left them. It went with a cloud passing away. After they got married, every day grew, the love grew less and less and less and less until it disappeared. Where did it go? The answer is, it was in love. Allah is Al-Wadud, the God of love. And so true love comes only from Allah. It doesn't come from a, from a wink across the classroom. <laughs> it doesn't come from rubbing shoulders in the marketplace. 
and it doesn't come from comparing blue jeans in a shopping mall. <laughs> Allah is Al Wadud, the God of love, and love comes only from Allah. This is the message we've come to deliver tonight in Lakemba on morals and character. We now marry, but this time we marry in Allah's name. Look at her. If she is pleasing to you, her appearance is pleasing to you. Hmm? And if in her public conduct she is virtuous, don't go digging into her private life. Because she may have done something and Allah put a cover on it. Like I did something and Allah put a cover on it. Like you did something and Allah put a cover on it. You're not supposed to go trying to remove the cover. To look and see what Allah had covered. But you're concerned with her public life. If in her public life she is virtuous. And if her appearance is pleasing to you, marry her. Marry her in Allah's name. You don't have to have a lot of money in your pocket to marry, you know. I had $75 in my pocket. And when the nikah was conducted by the chief imam of New York, he said, he said, Imran, you got to pay $25 to the doc, to the, to the masjid. Yeah. So I had $50 left in my pocket. Yeah. And praise be to Allah, my wife is here tonight. It's been a very happy marriage. You don't have to have a lot of money. You can still marry when you don't have money. Provided you have some food to eat and clothes to wear. And you don't need a house for $500,000. <laughs> so marry in Allah's name. And when you marry in Allah's name, then live with each other in a manner pleasing to Allah. If your neighbors like it, if the big family likes it, and if Australia likes the way you live, alhamdulillah. But if you want to live your life pleasing to Allah, and Australia doesn't like it, or Sydney doesn't like it, or your neighborhood doesn't like it, then say to them, that's just too bad for you. Because I am not going to live my life to please you and displease my Lord. What happens when you marry her in Allah's name and then you live with her in a manner pleasing to Allah? وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ أَنْ خَلَقَ لَكُمْ مِنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ أَزْوَاجًا لِتَسْكُنُوا إِلَيْهَا وَجَعَلَ بَيْنَكُمْ مَوَدَّةً وَرَحْمَةً إِنَّ فِي ذَلِكَ لَآيَاتٍ لِكَوْمِ يَتَفَكَّرُونَ And amongst his signs, among the pages of the big book with thousands and thousands and thousands of pages is this page that he has created for you from amongst your very, your very selves he's created your mates that you might dwell with each other in a state of sukun 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 is peace sukun is tranquility sukun is contentment there are things in life which money cannot buy. And sukoon is one of them. Yeah. There are things in life which money cannot buy. But there are some investment bankers in Manhattan who would want to dispute that. There are things in life which money cannot buy. And sukoon is one of them. You now live with each other in a state of sukoon. But how does sukoon come? وَجَعَلَ بَيْنَكُمْ مَوَدَّةِ It is Allah who now places love betwixt your hearts. When Allah puts love between your hearts, He doesn't put love alone. He puts something else with love. But you didn't know it. 
He says, وَجَعَلَ بَيْنَكُمْ مَوَدَّةً وَرَحْمَةً He put love and he put kindness. So when you get married, it's not Rambo getting married. <laughs> love and kindness. When there is love and there is kindness betwixt your hearts, then you'll get sukoon. I tell you something. There are those who will have to wait until the day of judgment before they can enter into Jannah. And there are those who will get a taste of Jannah, a little piece of Jannah right here on earth. You marry in Allah's name. You live with each other in a manner pleasing to Allah. And guess what happens? Every day, the love increases. It grows more and more and more and more. Until one day you ask, we already have so much love for each other, how much more love can there be? The answer is, Allah is Al-Wadud. He is infinite in his being and infinite in his attributes, his sifa. And so there is no limit to the amount of love you can have. This is where we've been attacked. When materialism takes over and the fear of Allah is no longer in the heart, now she, this girl, when you look at her, she has no reality beyond her material reality. And so when you go to her now, you no longer go to her for what you can give to her. Rahma. Now you go to her for what you can take from her. To satisfy your need. Anytime a boy goes to a girl to take from her that which will satisfy his need, it ain't love anymore, it's now called lust. It's called lust. And you could never have enough of it. It's like wine, halal wine of course, from Jannah. And when you, when you have love with each other, love from Allah, then you take only one sip, one sip, and your thirst is quenched. Praise be to Allah. And you can get on with your work, with your life. You can go to work, you can go farming and so on because your thirst is quenched. But when it is no longer love, it is now lust. And you sip from this wine, the thirst is still there. So now you go to two women and three and four and six and eight, a fellow called Magic Johnson, Magic Johnson, the basketball player. He had 200 women. He boasted about it. And the more you drink, the more your thirst increases. Until it becomes an addiction. Al-Hakum al-Takathur. Hatta zurtumul maqabir. This thirst of lust will eventually destroy you and take you to your grave. Because every single woman you see, you want her. Not for what you can give to her, but from what you can take from her. There's a difference, I said, between a man and a rat. Shall I tell you the difference? Yeah. yeah. Men, they love the sunshine. Men, they love the sunshine. Rats, they don't like the sunshine at all. 
Men, when they have a woman in their life, they want to do it the right way. So they marry her. And they bring her out into the sunshine so the world can see her. And so she can walk in the sunshine with dignity and with honor. This is my wife. But rats are not like that. Rats do what they have to do in the dark. And rats cannot liberate the Holy Land. Only a man can do it. The little boy is 12 years of age. Shall I remind you about him tonight? And he has a stone in his hand. And he's facing an Israeli tank. There's never been oppression like this in all of history. Never. This is truly a beast. Da battle up which has emerged out of the Holy Land. And this beast has a tank. And this young man has no fear in his heart. He's just 12 years of age. And he takes that stone to fight the tank. That little 12-year-old boy is the man. Because he's banished fear from his heart. But you can have a white beard like man's. But you have her in the dark. Nobody knows about the other woman. No, no, no. Nobody knows. Jazakumullah. Khair. She's not allowed to come out in the open. Hmm? She cannot do what the Messenger of Allah did. Shall I tell you what the Messenger of Allah did? He used to run races with her. And sometimes she would beat him. She's only 15, 16 years of age, so she must be running like a, like a deer, very fast. And he's about 60 years of age, like me. And sometimes he would beat her. That's good condition, eh? <laughs> Where were they running? In the bedroom? No, it couldn't be in the bedroom. Guess why? Because when he would stand up for Salatul Tahajjud, when he stands, she would stretch out her legs. And when he'd go down in Sijda, she would pull in her legs. So that wasn't a $500,000 house. It was too small a room for them to run races. So he and his wife, sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam, were running races in the sunshine. That's a man. That's a man. But the rat keeps her in the dark. He never informs anyone this is his woman. He mightn't even have her as a wife. He has her as a living wife or maybe as a daytime wife, and he has another one for the nighttime and so on. Rats are different from men. That is lust out there. And that can never ever be quenched. And it'll take you into the grave. What is the punishment for those who depart from the sunnah of he who used to run races with her in public? And who goes in the dark like a rat for a woman. The Prophet ﷺ went in, he was allowed to look into Jahannam. And there he saw some men sitting in front of a table laden with meat. There was one plate or platter with rotten stinking meat. And there was another platter with Fresh meat, nicely cooked. And these men were eating from the rotten, stinking meat when they had the fresh meat, nicely cooked, right there in front of them. 
So he asked Jibra'il alayhi salam, who are these men? And Jibra'il alayhi salam responded and explained, these are the men who left the wives that Allah had made halal for them. And they had gone to women who were haram for them. And so in this life, you live like a rat. And in that life, it's going to be rotten meat. But for the purposes of our lecture, قَدْ أَفْلَحَ مَنْ زَكَّاهَا وَقَدْ خَابَ مَنْ دَسَّاهَا Whosoever corrupts himself eternally, internally, will end up in the garbage bin. You cannot fight any battles to liberate the Holy Land. And this is the most important thing for you here tonight. Because the jihad to liberate the Holy Land has already started. Not even the government of Australia can stop that. No one can stop it. This jihad will not end until a Muslim army liberates the Holy Land. This has been their method of attack. First of all, to attack you with lust. But then there's another attack, I want to speak of it briefly and then we'll end. The attack is on morals and character. The source of the attack is modern Western civilization, which is being used by Dajjal to accomplish his mission of ruling the world from Jerusalem so that he could successfully impersonate the Messiah. What is the second prong of the attack with which to destroy internal power? The answer is, when any people adopt materialism, that there is no reality beyond material reality, then your supreme objective in life will be eat and drink and be merry because tomorrow we die. It is the satisfaction of material needs which now become the most important thing in life. So you want to acquire as much as you can acquire from the material world. You never have enough. Have you ever heard it before? You never have enough. You always want more and yet more and yet more. What happens when a people are infected with the disease of greed? What happens when a people are infected with the disease that material wealth equals status. In order for me to have status in Sydney, I must have a BMW. In order for me to have status in Sydney, I must have a high paying job and live in an exclusive residential area. Then I'm a somebody. But if I don't even have a car, and I'm living in a little flat, and I'm drawing a small salary, then I'm a nobody. Has it ever reached you? This kind of propaganda? Huh? That is the second method of attack on morals and character. Surah Al-Kahf of the Quran came down to warn us and protect us from Dajjal. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us a beautiful story in Surah Al-Kaf. It is a story of the rich man and the poor man. The rich man has the two gardens and they're very fertile. And there's a river running between the two gardens and so there's natural irrigation. And he invests in his gardens and the produce is abundant. Grapevines and date palms and what have you, cornfields. And the rich man now believes that because he has this wealth, he's a somebody. And because the poor man does not have this wealth, he's a nobody. 
And so his wealth has corrupted him. That is the disease of the modern age. He believes that his wealth will last forever. That's what they believe out there. And he now looks down upon the poor man condescendingly. But the poor man warns him. And those tonight who are not earning much money and working hard for the little that they get. Tonight they are going to be comforted by these words. And there are many amongst us who don't earn much money. The poor man warned him. He said, when you enter into your gardens, you should remember Allah. And you should thank Allah, Masha Allah. For remember, Allah can destroy what Allah gave to you. And Allah can give to me better than what he has given to you. That is the hope and that is the comfort tonight for those who are less than wealthy. The rich man did not heed the warning. When you want wealth, you take it however you can get it. You even have to cut some corners to get the wealth. Sometimes you've got to rip off people to get the wealth. I want the money. It doesn't matter how it comes. That's what I want, the money. But eventually Allah will destroy you because you're internally corrupt. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala withdrew the water. And as the water was withdrawn, the gardens crumbled. As water is now being withdrawn from the state of Israel. As the gardens crumbled, then the rich man wrung his hands like this. And guess what he said? Ya laytani lam ushrik bi rabbi ahada. In the process of corrupting himself with greed, he had committed shirk. Tonight's lecture is was a lecture to explain to you why is the attack being launched on the morals and character of the Muslim youth? And it's succeeding. What is the objective of this attack? And who is launching the attack? We've explained to you the enemy who is launching this attack on you and on me. That enemy has as, a, has his, as his objective to destroy your power, to destroy your capacity to build that power with which to be able to wage the jihad to liberate the Holy Land. If we are to respond to that enemy and make amends for the mistakes that we committed yesterday because we didn't know, or we were foolish, I was also foolish in my life, then the answer to that enemy is for tonight the heart to turn to Allah and to say to yourself, I don't want to be a rat anymore. No. That was yesterday. Today I'm a different man. I want to be a man. When it comes to a woman, when she comes into my life, I want to bring her into the sunshine. So the whole world can see, this is my woman. I have married her. She is my wife. And I will not go into the dark to be a rat. When you purify the heart, then Allah says, Qad aflaha man zakkaha. Those who purify the heart, they will succeed. Tonight the message has been, and it's a simple message tonight. It is sufficient to have simple food to eat. It is sufficient to have simple clothing to wear. It is sufficient to live in a simple home. 
and be content with whatever I have as risk. Because the yardstick with which me Allah measures is different from the yardstick with which Australia measures. In Allah's yardstick, inna akramakum, inna Allahi atqaakum. Those who are noblest in the sight of Allah, standing tallest in the sight of Allah, are not the ones with the BMWs, but in their heart there's godlessness. It is those who in their hearts have the fear of Allah. When you have the fear of Allah in your heart, then Allah will give you a way out of your difficulties. Let us end with this ayah of the Quran. Because there are many tonight who have difficulties in their lives. Whosoever has the fear of Allah in his heart, Allah will open a way. Allah will open a way for him out of his difficulties. And Allah will provide for him from sources he cannot possibly imagine. And whosoever puts his trust in Allah, Allah is sufficient for such people. May Allah bless all our 17 and 18 and 19 year old tonight. And grant that they may grow strong in Islam as men who will fight to liberate the Holy Land. Rabbana taqabbal minna innaka anta samir alim wa tub alayna ya mawlana innaka anta tawab rahim. برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين آمين